Hello everyone, my name is Caleb Cornelou and in this video I want to give you my post-debate thoughts on the debate uh, with Azra Rashid between Christians, myself and Hatun and Azra Rashid on the Muslim side. And I want to begin by pointing out that first of all Azra Rashid actually didn't give any positive arguments why anyone should be a Muslim. No arguments, not, not one argument that would suggest that Muhammad was a prophet, not one argument that would suggest the Quran was from God. There was, there was just nothing. There was nothing positive about Islam. In fact, all he did was attack Christianity. And when we met to uh, organize the debate, we agreed that we wouldn't throw a thousand arguments at the other side, uh, hoping to swamp them with arguments so that they couldn't answer all the questions. We agreed that we would have a limited, decent number of arguments and we would look at them more closely. But instead, he just tried to fire off a million uh, arguments against Christianity, all of which were actually very, very weak. But because we didn't have time to answer them all, it looked like he had a very strong position. So that's the first thing I want to say, that he gave no positive case for Islam and he threw a bunch of weak arguments towards Christianity. Secondly, I think there was a good um, argument for the Trinity that was given in the uh, opening statement. Let me play it to you. Now, if you're a Muslim, you're probably wondering how we're going to give an explanation or a definition of the Trinity. So that's why I've decided to start here. We believe that God is one being, but three persons. Now, you might ask, what is the difference between a being and a person? A being is that quality about you that makes you what you are. I am a human being. And everybody here in this room here tonight are human beings. But a person is that quality about you that makes you who you are. So we say that, so for example, I am Caleb Cornelou. I'm a nice, caring, compassionate person. But what I am, that is a human being, is different to who I am, that is Caleb Cornelou. So we say God is one being, but three persons. Now, that is not a contradiction. If I was to say that God was one being but three beings, that would be a contradiction. If I was to say God was one person but three persons, that would be a contradiction. But we say God is one being but three persons. It is a mystery, but it is not a contradiction. And one thing you'll notice when you watch the debate is that Azra Rashid didn't address that argument. He didn't try to refute the Trinity at all, which is really good because Muslims often try to attack us first at the Trinity. And here, it was like he just didn't have an argument. He tried to just create his own definition and attack that. But he just couldn't attack the definition that I had given him. And so I think that's really good for us because we have a bunch of Muslims uh, who heard a great definition of the Trinity that he was unable to refute. So that's fantastic. He, he then tried to argue, and I thought this was quite interesting. He tried to argue that I did not quote from the Quran at any point and that I didn't uh, try to attack the Quran at any point. <laughs> If you notice in the presentation, not a single verse of the Qur'an was quoted. The individual, uh, my interlocutor, went straight onto the hadith. That is completely false. Watch my arguments here against the Qur'an. It's the first thing I did. Watch this. Having said that, why do I think that you should not be a Muslim? First of all, the Qur'an fails to engage meaningfully with the Christian concept of the Trinity. If you're a Christian, and there's not many Christians in the room here tonight, but when I first began reading the Quran, the first thing I noticed is that the author of the Quran didn't seem to understand what the Trinity was. And every time it tried to attack the Trinity, it was attacking a straw man argument. For example, it speaks of the Trinity as the Father, Mary and the Son. It speaks of the Trinity as three separate gods. You see, so the author of the Quran doesn't seem to understand what the Trinity is. In fact, Muslims today are far better at their attempts to combat the Trinity than what the author of the Quran was when it was written in Muhammad's time. The second reason why you should not be a Muslim is because the, uh, Muhammad is not mentioned in the Torah or the Gospel. Why is this important? In Surah chapter 7, verse 157, we read this. Those who follow the messenger, the prophet who can neither read nor write, i.e. Muhammad, whom they find written with them in the Torah and the Gospel with them. You see, this surah is saying that you can find Muhammad mentioned in the Torah and the Gospel, 
that was with the Jews and Christians at the time of Muhammad. Now we have at least 85 Taurus uh, manuscripts from before 150 to 300 years before Jesus was born, let alone Muhammad, and yet there is no mention in them of Muhammad whatsoever. And what's interesting is that he didn't actually respond to those arguments. He didn't respond to the fact that uh, Muhammad is not mentioned in the Torah or the Gospel. That is what the Quran falsely claims. He didn't deal with the fact that the Trinity attacks in the Quran are attacks on a straw man definition of the Trinity. He didn't deal with that either. So very clearly, he was either not listening or he was being dishonest, hoping that the audience would forget. The next point that I want to look at is he tried to argue that all of the commentaries, all of the Christian commentaries on the Gospel of John say that the Apostle John did not write the Gospel of John. And he specifically mentioned the Schofield Reference Bible. Now, <laughs> this is really funny. Watch the clip. It is that you mentioned the Apostle John and uh, the chain of narration back to John. Biblical scholars acknowledge that John did not even write the uh, testament that we have the Gospel of John. This Gospel of John was not written by the Apostle John. The author is someone else. You can check your own Schofield or any of the uh, commentaries on the Bible. You'll find that John did not even write those Bibles. Now, I'm going to put a link in the description of this video to the uh, Schofield Reference Bible and its section on the Gospel of John. And at the very beginning, right at the beginning of its notes on the Gospel of John, the very first sentence we read this. The fourth gospel was written by the Apostle John. <laughs> Check it out for yourself. I mean, he's just making stuff up, right? Just from the top of his head, he's just making it up. No commentary mentions that uh, the Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John and even the Schofield. Look at the Schofield Bible yourself. You can check your own Schofield or any of the uh, commentaries on the Bible. You'll find that John did not even write those Bibles. This is just silliness, just making things up from the top of his head. Let me just give you a list of commentaries which... Uh, clearly uh, um, demonstrate that the Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John. You have D.A. Carson's uh, Gospel Commentary. He's an eminent scholar, a really good scholar. He uh, has a whole chapter on why the Gospel of John was written by the Apostle John. You have the Holman Bible Commentary series does the same thing. The Tyndale Bible Commentary series, the Zondervan Exegetical Commentary series. You know, the list could go on and on. There's probably hundreds, literally hundreds if not thousands of commentaries which defend the fact that the Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John. So that argument's ridiculous. Um, he didn't uh, deal with the manuscript evidence I gave for the Gospel of John. Didn't deal with that at all. He didn't deal with the chain of narration I gave for the Gospel of John. Didn't deal with that at all. Hopeless, hopeless arguments in this area. And he didn't deal with the fact that the testimony of the Church Fathers proves the entire New Testament. He didn't even touch that argument. Just just didn't go anywhere near it. So that argument stands if he failed to address it. Let me play the clip to you so you can see it for yourself. So I want to just look at two manuscripts of the Gospel of John. P52 is uh, housed in John Ryland's library, about 10 minutes walk from here. It's about the size of a credit card and it is dated to 125 AD. That is 35 years from when the original Gospel of John or Gospel according to John was written. Now it's only a fragment, so it doesn't prove the whole gospel, but we have P66, which is dated between 150 and 200 AD, which contains almost the entire gospel of John. That's between uh, 50 or 60 and 110 years from the original. Now, furthermore, we have wit the witness of the church fathers. <clears throat> St. Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers, who was executed for his faith by being beheaded, tells us that John wrote the Gospel of John. Now, St Irenaeus gets his information from St Polycarp. St Polycarp gets his information from the Apostle John himself because he was one of the Apostle John's own disciples. How do we know these people are telling the truth? Well, as I said, St Irenaeus was executed for his faith and Polycarp was burned alive and he didn't quite die, so they fed him while he was still alive to wild animals in the Colosseum. So we have a very close connection between the Apostle John, then Polycarp, and St Irenaeus. And since these people were martyrs who died for their faith, it's very hard to believe that they would be lying to us about what they tell us. Furthermore, St Irenaeus tells us that all the churches in all the world believed in the four gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They all believed that the Apostle Paul was an apostle of Christ 
and they all believed that he helped the Apostle Peter establish the church in Rome. None of those arguments were dealt with in his rebuttal period or his so-called opening statement, which was really just a rebuttal period. He also failed to deal with the fact that Jewish prophecy mentions the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. I gave very clear evidence for that from Jewish scriptures that remain in the Jewish scriptures to this day. He also failed to deal with the fact that the historical evidence proves that Jesus was crucified. And I made mention of the annals of Imperial Rome by Tacitus, who was the proconsul of Rome in the first century, second only to the emperor. I mean, how much stronger evidence do you want? This is the, probably the strongest historical evidence you could think of to support the death and crucifixion of Jesus. Clearly, he didn't have an argument against that. And so that's why he didn't say anything about it. Watch the clip for yourself. Now, this is also confirmed in the historical records of the Roman Empire. The first century AD, there was a man named Tacitus who was the uh, proconsul of Rome in his time, very high position, second only to the emperor, and he records the death of Jesus in the annals of Imperial Rome, saying that Jesus was killed under Pontius Pilate with the extreme death penalty. The places where he looked the most silly was when he tried to get into the text of the Bible. Uh, let me give you an example. He tried to argue that Jesus overturned the money uh, tables in the temple courts because the Jews were committing usury. Now, <laughs> that's just completely false. Uh, usury is when you charge high interest rates on loans. Right? <laughs> just, just, that just wasn't happening there. That's just not the context. The context was that um, the Jews were selling sacrificial animals in the temple courts. And the temple courts were the only place that the Gentiles could come and worship God. And Jesus specifically says, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. That's what he says after he turned all the tables off. So he was upset about the Gentiles not being able to come and worship God. That was his issue. He tried to argue that Sahih Bukhari cancelled muta marriage, that Muhammad in Sahih Bukhari cancelled muta marriage, which is marriage for lust. But he gave no evidence for it. He's, you watch his videos. He always makes these claims but gives you no citation. And that's exactly what we have here. I gave him two citations in Sahih Bukhari that uh, uh, clearly proved that muta marriage was approved of by Muhammad. And muta marriage is the marriage for lust. Additionally, he tried to argue that child marriage was prohibited in the Quran. But again, he gave no reference. You notice child marriage is prohibited in the Quran, but that was not quoted. Child marriage is prohibited in the Quran. There is no passage in the Quran that uh, says child marriage was cancelled. Can you imagine if there was that Sahih Bukhari is collecting hadiths saying he's marrying a six year old girl and yet the Quran says that child marriage is cancelled? I don't think the early Muslims believed any in Quranic interpretation of that. And I challenge Azra Rashid if he's watching this video, show me a passage in the Quran. Don't start quoting Arabic and change the meaning of the words. Give me a scholar that interprets that surah, whatever surah you've got in your mind, that cancels child marriage. Give me a scholar that translates it that way. Give me a translation that translates it that way. You won't find it. He then tried to claim that Aisha was really 17 and not 6 when she married Muhammad. But he failed to address the arguments that I actually gave in my opening statement. Secondly, there is good reason to believe that Aisha was prepubescent when the marriage was consummated. In Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 6130, we read this, and this is before the marriage, narrated again by Aisha. I used to play with the dolls in the presence of the Prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's messenger used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves. So these were little girls that would, would hide because the messenger was coming. But the Prophet would call them to join and to play with me. And then it says this, the playing with the dolls and similar images is forbidden. But it was allowed for Aisha at that time, as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. Now then we read in Sahih Muslim, hadith number 3309, narrated again by Aisha. Aisha, Allah be pleased with her, reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven, and she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine, and her dolls were with her. So the previous hadith said she was allowed to play with dolls because she was prepubescent, and here we say, it says in this uh, Sahih Hadith, that she was also taking her dolls with her when her marriage was consummated. And might I add, I've never read any Hadith which would suggest that she was not prepubescent. 
And this is very strong evidence to suggest that she was indeed prepubescent when she was married. But in addition to those hadiths, let me read to you another hadith from Sahih Bukhari. These are not isolated reports, is what he tries to argue. Sahih Bukhari 3894, narrated by Aisha. The Prophet engaged me when I was a girl of six. We went to Medina and stayed at the home, and it's got this Arabic names, Arabic woman's name. Then I got ill and my hair fell out. I submit that her hair fell out because she was stressed out about moving out of her home. Later on, my hair grew again and my mother, Um Rumun, came to me while I was playing in a swing with some, girl, some of my girlfriends. Clearly, she's a little girl, right? She called me and I went to her not knowing what she wanted to do to me. She could, so she's not knowing what her mother is up to. She's not awaiting her marriage day, right? She has no idea what's going on. She caught me by the hand and made me stand at the door of her house. She caught me, so she was you know, running around. I was breathless, so she was breathless from running. Then, I was breathless then, and when my breathing became all right, she took some water and rubbed my face and head with it. You know, like you'd rub a little girl's face or a little boy's face to clean all the muck from all the playing around. Then she took me into the house. There in the house I saw some Ansari women who said best wishes and Allah's blessing and good luck. She doesn't even know what's going on at this point, right? <laughs> this is supposed to be a marriage day, right? 17 years old, apparently. Then she entrusted me to them and they prepared me for marriage. Unexpectedly, unexpectedly, Allah's apostle came to me in the forenoon and my mother handed me over to him. And at that time, I was a girl of nine years of age. Clearly, from this hadith and the other one, she was a little girl, and the other hadith clearly proved she was prepubescent. Very clear. He tried to then argue that it was okay at that time to marry little girls at that age. When you're 55, it's okay to have sex with a nine-year-old, apparently, uh, because of the culture of the time, he says. But what he fails to realize is my argument was based from the Quran, where the Quran in Surah 33, verse 21, says this, Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad, you have a perfect example to follow. That was my argument. And he's the last prophet. So he's the perfect example for everyone. And you'll notice that when I asked the congregation, the people that were there, who would give their nine-year-old girl away to a 55-year-old man, at least two people put their hands up. At least two. One of them was identified on the camera. So clearly we have people looking at these hadiths saying, yeah, that's okay, I'll do that. Why? Because Muhammad did it, right? He's the perfect example. So clearly Azra is trying to get out of things that clearly other Muslims are following. In fact, in many Muslim countries, the, the age where they cover up is actually nine years old. So there's a reason for that, right? So uh, let's be realistic and stop lying and fabricating uh, answers to get around the obvious truth. Now, Azra did try to make some arguments from the Bible that were worthwhile, that are worth looking at. For example, he has in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, he quoted the part about Jesus not coming to abolish the law. Uh, Jesus mentions that he came to fulfill the law here in Matthew. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So I want to look at that in a little bit of detail. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. That's important. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Okay, clearly the law points to something beyond itself. When you study the law, it points to something. For example, the Passover uh, points to the sacrifice of Jesus. The sacrifices throughout the law point to the sacrifice of Jesus. You have um, the Sabbath day uh, as well. The Sabbath day was the day when uh, the Jews were not permitted to work or to collect anything for food, but they had to trust in God's provision that, he had, that they had already been given. That was symbolic of salvation by faith apart from our own work. So it pointed forward to something. But even more, the moral aspects of the law pointed forward to the fact that you and me cannot keep the law and that somebody would have to pay the price for us. This is going to come up a bit later. And so Jesus is not saying, I've not come to abolish the law 
but you have to keep the law. He's saying, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, right? It's fulfilling what the law was pointing to. Additionally, the law was not actually given to me as a Gentile. The law was given to the Jews. And even Jewish believers, Messianic Jews today, keep many aspects of the law, if not all the law, not for their salvation, but just as a mark of their national identity. So this doesn't apply to me as a, as a Gentile because the law was never given to me. It, it, it was given to the Jews. But also many Jews, believing Jews who trust in Christ alone for salvation, still actually get circumcised and things like that, not for their salvation, but just as a national identity thing. And many of the Jews and early Christians went to the temple and continued to worship there until the temple was destroyed. So this argument, um, I don't think works. That's my opinion. Other people have different opinions. That's fine. But I don't think that argument is enough, is enough to reject Christianity. He also tried to make the argument that um, Jesus, according to Paul, was under a curse. Now, this one's really silly, right? You, you, and I can understand as a Muslim, you're thinking, wow, what a great argument, right? But it's actually really, really dumb, right? It's a dumb argument. Why? Let's have a look. Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Look, you could go to any church, like literally even the most lukewarm Christian churches, and they will be able to... Uh, respond to this um, point. <clears throat> so Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. We read this. For all who rely on the works of the law un are under a curse. As it is written, curse is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now, he says, well, Jesus kept the law, therefore Jesus is under a curse, right? Now, that's really silly. This is talking about people who have sinned, which is the whole world except for Jesus, who are relying on the law for their salvation. Now, Jesus doesn't need to rely on the law for salvation because he's never sinned, right? And the, when it says they are under a curse, it's not talking about like a voodoo curse, right? It's talking about the punishment that the law prescribes. And the punishment is death, death and hell, right? So this verse, all it is saying is that if you are trying to look at the law for your salvation, then because you fail to keep the law, you will then be punished by the punishments prescribed in the law. That's all this is saying. And so Jesus then takes that punishment for us. When it says that he became a curse for us, it's not saying he got a voodoo curse put on him, right? It's just saying he took the punishment. He took the punishment that you and I deserve. That's what it's saying. So Jesus did not rely on the law for salvation. And if we try, because he was perfect, and if we try to rely on the law for salvation, then we will fail and we'll be under the curse of the law, the punishment of the law, because we have broken the law. That's all he's saying. I mean, how simple do you have to be? You have to be, re and, and, and this is the point I want to make as well. Ezra Rashid said that he read the entire Bible. I think he's lying. I think it's flat out lying. I can just tell he's lying. He doesn't know anything about the Bible, right? Just the fact that he gets this wrong tells me that he was lying, okay? Because this is basic of basic. If you were a new Christian of a month, you would know this. That's how simple this is. New Christian of a month, you'd know this point. So I think Azra was lying about that. And um, I want you to know, uh, uh, one last point before I go. He claimed that Jesus went to hell. Where's your reference? Where's your reference? He keeps citing things without any references. And so I submit to you that Azra Rashid made very bad points that looked fantastic to a Muslim audience. But the reality is his arguments were weak. He failed to deal with my arguments and he failed to defend Islam in that debate, in my opinion.